I came into the NBA at 02, but I wouldn't say that I really broke through until 2006, 2007. Um, and then after that season, I was pretty much a household name and, and a fixture in the league. Was fortunate enough to be able to play 14 years, um, win a championship with the Golden State Warriors in 2017. Oddly enough, I had just signed a three-year contract that 2017 year, and I lucked up and won. And at the time, I was going through a tough divorce with my ex-wife, um, and she was playing some games with allowing me to see my twin boys, who are my world. So in the midst of signing a three-year deal, winning a championship, the following year, as you guys know, the Warriors won again, so I probably would have won two championships, but I decided to retire and because I really felt like I was missing so much time with my kids. Um, my twins at the time were just turning nine, and, I mean, uh, parents in here, you know you don't get those days back. So I was in the Bay. They were in L.A. I was going months without seeing them. And to me, it just wasn't worth – the money wasn't worth it. The, 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 the space between us wasn't worth it. So I ended up retiring, coming back to L.A., finding a house, and then, you know, to me, becoming a full-time dad. So I was only the second athlete in the history of athletes besides Dwayne Wade to win full custody of his kids – so I'm a full-time father now of uh, three boys. So the two twins are the ones I'm on custody of. And then I have a 16-month-old son, too. So I have an opportunity to, to start all over, which is a beautiful thing because I was a very hands-on father uh, with, my, with my twins. You know, unfortunately, with the situation with their mom and I didn't work out. But while I was, you know, I had the twins while I was in the midst of my career, um, 2008. So I was as, as hands-on as I was. I was gone half the year traveling. So with this time around, you know, with Ashton, my 16 month old, it's 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 a day by day process. I love it. I love to see the growth daily. I love to see he thinks he runs the house at 16 months. He's the boss. He's starting to talk and tell everyone what to do. The refrigerator is his playground. Anytime you turn your head, the, the whole refrigerator will be unloaded in like one minute. So um, but just really enjoying the small things. And I also think, you know, unfortunately, through this covid uh, epidemic, I think everyone's kind of got off their hamster wheel a little bit. I think we get so consumed in our day-to-day -day life and our bubbles that we kind of forget to just sit back and smell the roses, you know, realize how precious this life is, how good of a life we have. And I think through this experience, um, you know, some of us have got to do that. And that's really what I've been able to appreciate. Um, you know, I've been able to just sit at home. Um, as Nathan said, I'm, I retired because I was traveling too much. And then in my post career, I've been traveling just as much with ESPN. Mm -hmm. I'm flying to New York once a week. I host a show for Complex that I fly to New York once a week. So this has been an opportunity for me just to kind of sit down, enjoy, you know, enjoy my life, enjoy my children, and really just be there every step of the way. So that's really what I've appreciated most about this process to where we're getting. But let me get back to the point at hand. So I, I, like I said, my career, I was labeled. I think there was a huge misconception of who I am. People got to see me for two hours, you know, three times a week uh, at night uh, playing basketball. And I was a very, you spoke on the Olympian. I was the exact opposite. I was very fiery. I was the team protector. I was the guy that if you mess with one of my teammates, you know, I'm going to be in that mix. Um, so kind of like, you know, hockey guy, there, 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 there's enforcers in hockey. I was the basketball enforcer. And I loved it, but it wasn't who it wasn't. It, it was a part of me, but it wasn't who I was. And I think everyone judged that little piece of two hours, you know, a couple of times a week, they would see me off of who they thought I was as a man. So that's why I said that the, the transition into media to me, even though it wasn't planned, I think it was necessary because I'm one of the many that once the media paints a narrative or a story or puts something out there, that's perception. So perception is reality these days. So, you know, some of you guys, may have heard of my playing career and they're like well he's the bad guy and it, it's like I said it was just my my competitive nature and you know my family or you know I, I treat my teammates like my family so you know I'm ready to do absolutely anything to protect my family and uh, that's on and off the court so my transition was was smooth surprisingly even though it wasn't planned um, I'd been fortunate enough like I said I grew up in a tough neighborhood with parents, but my parents, what I, I would say were functioning drug addicts. They always had the wherewithal. We were always dressed well. We always ate well. And they always put me, I'm Italian and black, but I grew up in very mixed neighborhoods. But my parents always put me in, you know, predominantly white schools and I never understood. You know, I always went to like my neighborhood kids, I would never get to go to school with them. And it would make me mad. Like, why, you know, why can't I go to school with my friends? But looking back on it now, 
it was probably the best thing that ever happened to me because I got a, a better education. I got to see what families are like. You know, the first time I ever ate dinner at a dinner table was with another family. The first time I ever went on a vacation was with another family. Holidays, the whole nine. So they really gave me that other side, which I think prepared me for this outside world. Um, so from high school, I went to UCLA, which was very diverse. <clears throat> but I would just always had a knack for speaking. And I think that's because my parents put me in schools that, you know, were going to prepare me for life. Um, so I was a good talker. So throughout my career, you know, I was always interviewed and, and the, the, the people who interviewed me would be like, well, wow, like the person we just saw playing and the person they're talking seemed like two different people. <laughs> so I'd always kind of pleasantly surprise people um, <clears throat> with just my, you know, just the way I carried myself. So when I got to the media and, and when, when I realized that the media was going to be an option post career, I kind of sat back and thought about, OK, well, I know a lot of these guys that I played with similar to me who have bad reputations, but they're not those guys. But that's the picture that the media has painted. Um, so along with my partner, Stephen Jackson, who I do all the smoke with. So when we got into media, you know, we were lucky enough to break into ESPN and Fox. So we're working both consistently. And we brought that real, raw, unapologetic realness to Analy uh, you know, to, to basketball analysts. Um, and too often there's so many people in the media that think because they studied it or because they talk about it all the time, they're professionals. You know, you got someone like Skip Bayless saying that Scottie Pippen is not an all-time great player when Michael Jordan says yeah, there would be no Michael Jordan without Scottie Pippen. You know, so I take offense to stuff like that because I know how hard, first of all, I know how amazing Scottie Pippen is, but I know how hard he had to work day in, day out to be able to do the things he did. And sometimes as players, we have a really hard time with people who've never been in our shoes. First of all, critiquing us. We understand it's their job to critique, but I think there's a way to respectfully critique people and not be disrespectful. And I feel too, too often today, the media just takes a disrespectful approach because they want clickbait. So they want to say something that's going to make everyone like, oh, shit, look what he just said about LeBron. Let me click on that. You know, knowing that he's just saying that for ratings. But at the same time, the media is so powerful, those narratives live. So he says something like, you know, LeBron is a horrible teammate and LeBron is this. And people that don't know LeBron, they're like, really? So it starts changing a few minds instead of just saying, you know, hey, LeBron might have gotten into a mix up with one of his teammates and there was a little issue. But, you know, his 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 track record speaks for itself. So myself and Steven Jackson started getting into the media, doing well, and we would kind of. I want to say call out, but not in a bad way, but just kind of start calling guys on their BS, you know, especially guys that didn't play. You know, guys that are talking just reckless about people, because so often today in media, it's not about being right it's about being first who can and that that's across all planes whether it you know life family business sports it's not necessarily about what really happened it's about let me try to be the first one to crack this breaking news and then if i'm wrong you know we can we can write something at the bottom page or run something across the bottom line of esp and we won't get that actual hey my bad i'm sorry i was wrong but that first narrative and and, and story you ran with is the one that normally sticks so I think my transition into media has just really been giving people that real side, that real edge, the authenticity. And it's been amazing from not only getting feedback from my former co uh, my former colleagues in the NBA, but, you know, getting co feedback from NBA or NFL players, Major League Baseball players that are just saying, you know, we really appreciate your honesty and your approach and really calling these guys out that have never done what we can do. You got to think most people get into media in their particular sporting field because they love that sport, but they just happen not to be good enough to play it. So let me, you know, let me study it and let me talk about it, which makes them think they're experts. You know, so like I said, we we, we, we try to go out there and give people a fair shake to, to give people a real in-depth understanding of, okay, well, we've been in game sevens of the NBA finals with two minutes to go and, you know, the, the whole world is watching you. We can yeah. tell you what that, we, we can tell you what that feels like. You know, not too many people in the world can tell you what that feels like. So we like to give you that real, raw, unapologetic view of, of what our life is really like. So I think we've been able to do that. You know, I've, I've, and like I said, I don't try to bully anyone, but I won't hold my tongue, you know. So I've had mix-ups with Stephen A. Smith. I've had mix-ups with Skip Bayless. I've had mix-ups with Nick Wright. And like I said, it's not really a, a disrespectful thing. It's just kind of really calling them on what they think they know, but they don't know. I think one big one that kind of really 
got our podcast off the ground was Stephen A. Smith has been notorious for the past three, four years of saying, stay off the weed. And it's been all over ESPN and all this kind of stuff. So I was seeing one time and he was talking about a former Dallas Cowboy player that threw his life away and he's wasting this and he's wasting that. And, and so when I heard that, it comes kind of just like, damn. So I actually found that player, DM'd him and talked to him about his story. Like, tell me why, you know, mm-hmm. what made you, you know, you're one of the top young defensive ends in, in the NFL making a shitload of money, like why, you know, why throw it away for weed? And he explained, you know, he's just like, you know, it's something that keeps me sane. It's something that allows me to sleep, allows me to focus. It takes pain away. <clears throat> I can't take it. I can't take these pills. They keep trying to pump me full of, they make me sick. Mm-hmm. It, it sounded just like my story. So I'm just like, you know, this is exact. This is the reason why I was smoking cannabis while I was in, while I was in the NBA. So right there, I kind of made me think like, okay, well, this dude is, you know, he's blasting people. And ESPN is the biggest platform in sports. So what most of the time, what's that's said on ESPN is, is is gospel for most people. So I just took it upon myself one day just to respectfully um, send out a um, a post on Instagram calling out Stephen A. Smith. Just hey, you know, I think instead of just you know ranting and, and, and raving and 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 trying to make these guys look stupid, I think you need to educate yourself on this because you don't know anything about weed. And oddly enough, he responded, and from there we got him on the show. Um, yep. All the smoke we we had him out there in New York. And we just sat down and had a very educated conversation about why we do it. Because I think so often we're stuck on the old narrative that, you know, cannabis is a gateway drug and it leads to what well, you name it. We've heard it all. <laughs> um, so now that there's there's actual medical research that's backing up um, the reasons why we smoke. You know, I particularly smoked it during my career was to focus because I had a crazy life off the court as well as on the court. It helped me sleep. It took pain away. And it just put me in a better mental state, you know. So I think that that that's doing it to, to understand when, when you when you hear it and realize how many athletes at the highest level, if you take the three major sports, baseball, football, basketball, a lot of people are doing it. You know what I mean? Uh, luckily, baseball and football don't necessarily test for it anymore, although football has been harsh in the past on it. Mm-hmm. A lot of these guys are doing it from the supers. When I tell you your, your kid's favorite player, I bet you eight out of 10 times uses cannabis in some form, whether it be smoking it, whether it be the tinctures, the drop, whatever the situation may be, they use it to the betterment of of their bodies. <clears throat> so to be able to just to continue to move forward and make people understand, OK, this is, you know, we are considered the one percent. You know, it, you have a better chance of being struck by lightning than being professional athletes. So <clears throat> for the one percent that have made it find that you know cannabis is more beneficial than all these other stuff they're pumping full i mean they're pumping us full of toradol that destroy your liver and kidneys they're giving you any kind of painkiller you can imagine that's going to temporarily mask one problem but cause tom cause long-term effects but and also possibly cause addiction so we are finally to a point now where the world is listening the world of sports is listening and i think that's because there's finally medical research backing that up because you know i've been a smoker for a long time and i'm, I'm a stoner i'm this i'm that there's so many stereotypes that were used but when i give people the reason why i'm doing it and then they compare that to what ucla published or you know someone in israel published you see mm-hmm. all the publishings of the benefits of they're like oh well, shit that's what he said it does that's why he said he uses it so you can go kind of step by step and kind of see um why we do it so we transitioned from Stephen a smith doing my show which was a very kind of Stephen a smith's interview put my all the smoke um show on the map because obviously he's a huge personality he had just signed a big i think 10 million dollar a year deal no reporters ever got that much money so it was a kind of a perfect storm and that conversation was what led it um so after that they had me on first take i want to say right before um, we all shut down and Stephen Smith, Stephen A. Smith and I had a 15 minute conversation about cannabis on ESPN. And that's unheard of, you know, considering I'm a former athlete and cannabis is such a no, no kind of situation that we're sitting on the biggest stage there is talking about cannabis and why we use it. So I think it was just a, a really tremendous eye opening experience for the world. And, um, you know, that's what I, I've been fortunate to do. I've kind of wanted to be that shield because I know plenty of my former teammates and, and colleagues use it and have been in trouble. Some guys have lost their careers. Some guys have been fined a bunch of money mm-hmm. and, and it's beneficial. So 
to kind of get back to the media side, that's what we've been wanting to do is we want to be the voice for the players. We want to be the voice for kind of the new new age, new millennial, because I think these policies and rules are so outdated. So we really took it upon ourselves to be those voices, to be those people. People come to us all the time. Can you tell Stephen A. Smith this? Or we didn't like he said that because it's kind of hard for them to talk to him right now because they get a bunch of shit. Well, you need to focus on your job. You need to do, well, this is my job now. So my job is to kind of, kind of steer the ship in, in, in this media space. So uh, All the Smoke came along, which is our podcast, if you guys don't know. And it, we've been shooting for about seven months, and we're one of the top podcasts in the world now. Um, it's been tremendous. I don't know how it happened. I still don't know how it happened. I have to slap myself every once in a while, like, yo, we really have something special here, you know, because it just came. I didn't even know what a podcast was when we started it. It came along very organically. Steven and myself were talking like, hey, we need to be able to really speak our mind. You know, we both, I work for ESPN, he works for Fox, and we understand there's some rules and regulations we have to somewhat follow. Mm -hmm. um, but we knew that a podcast would kind of set us free, even though we didn't really know what it was. We knew we can freely speak. Um, so I did a DeMarcus Cousins interview for his documentary. And one of the producers is like, hey, you know, we heard you want to do a sh podcast. You should talk to Showtime. Sat down, talked to Showtime. They loved me. I loved what they were saying. We had no sizzle. We had no nothing. They just kind of went off my personality and they signed and they gave us a deal. So I don't think they knew what we had. I didn't know what we had. We had a very small budget. And as this started growing, they're just like, oh, shit. So we had to <laughs> kind of reconfigure the budget. And really, you know, we, we, we built a studio out here in L.A. We have yeah. a studio out there in New York. We've traveled around to speak now. And now we're kind of the voice for sports, culture, you name it. You know, people look to us and, and kind of hold our word as they're holding ESPN's word and Fox's word now, which is great because you, if you look at ESPN and Fox, they're always taking pieces from our shows now. Like, you know, when, when Dwayne Wade talked about the transition of his 12-year-old uh, son into being a daughter, we, we broke that. And that made national worldwide news uh you know we had kobe's last interview rest in peace to my brother kobe we had kobe's last interview uh we had stephen a smith we had snoop we've had a lot of just ground shifting interviews that have kind of changed people's ideas about who we are and um my, my whole goal with this was always to like i said I, jack and i both had bad raps our whole career so our goal was to really humanize our guests show our guests that the person you think you know, you really don't know. They really are a much different person off the field, off the screen, you know, out of the booth. So really just humanize and letting everyone know, hey, we're just like you, you know, we're just like everyone else. You know, we get kids that are sick. We lose, you know, I lost my, my, my mom. We go through divorces. We go through everything else the rest of the world goes through, but just our mishaps are for the world to see and for the world to judge and for the world to poke at us. But we are really no different, you know, but I think people think because we make a bunch of money that that makes us immune to hearing people talk bad about us or disrespecting our families and all that stuff hurts. I remember talking to Kobe in his last interview. I asked him, like, what was throughout your career? What was the most hurtful thing that was said? And he's like, to be honest, I heard it all and it all hurt. You know what I mean? So people think because we make so much money or because he's Kobe Bryant that he's Superman and we can say whatever we want to him and it won't hurt him. And that's not true because we're human. So anyone that's getting constant disrespect or talking about their family or just being rude, like we feel that, you know. So my whole goal in this space was to kind of change the narrative, change people's ideas of athletes and entertainers, letting everyone know that we're just like you guys. And I think more than ever now we're getting access to behind people's lives. You know, we're, we're, everyone's watching The Last Dance right now. And this is almost like a social media version of what was going on in Michael Jordan's life because yeah. we never got to see Mike open up like that. You know, today we're spoiled. Our kids get to see LeBron's house and LeBron work out and LeBron do this and LeBron do that. When I was a kid, when I was my kid's age, we never got to see nothing from Mike. Like Mike was the basketball killer and that's all we knew. And he sold amazing shoes. So now we're getting a chance to see behind the scenes and seeing how actually crazy and somewhat dysfunctional that locker room was. You know, you had to deal with a crazy Dennis Rodman who wanted to party during the regular season. You got to deal with an unhappy Scottie Pippen who's one of the best players in the world, but he's getting paid like one of the, the you know, one of the average players in the league. You got Michael's ego and personality and, and, and will to win. You got Phil Jackson, who I was fortunate enough to play for the Lakers, who's kind of like the mastermind behind this and has to manage all these egos. So we're getting a real in-depth look of what the 90s Bulls went through 
you know, compared to what we go through day to day. So I just like to dispel all the myths about athletes because I think it really hurts people and they don't understand the media is very powerful. So like I said, when they're about being first, not right. So they can put out, they put out so many stories about me that were wrong. And I'm just like, God damn, you guys really don't like me. You know what I mean? So that's why I think it's been refreshing for me to almost make a complete makeover for myself, my post career. Um, and I've done that through social media being on Showtime, being on ESPN, hosting a show on Complex, uh, my social media kind of just showing my, my my relationship with my kids. And I really have changed people's perceptions of who they thought I was. And like Nathan uh, mentioned before, you know, I made, you know, I made very good, comfortable money um, in the NBA, but I really feel like this next step in my career, I'm, uh, I'm more popular and I don't really care about that, but from a, from a, building your brand standpoint that's important so i'm more popular than i've ever been i'm hotter than i've ever been as far as what i say and i'll start seeing it everywhere so i really think this next step in my post career is going to be tremendous opportunity for me to just continue to grow to continue to expand help give back help change the narrative and help change media yeah well it's uh it's definitely thank you it's definitely a story about an ascent um and i keep thinking about as you go through it that you have to go there to know there and you guys went there so the empathy that sort of came from that to be able to sort of connect you know with the people around you i think is sort of very clear and what you guys are able to sort of expose in a good way is the fertility of professional athletes and when you see that they're fragile they're people that actually becomes almost their their superpower in its own way. so it's been great to sort of see that uh, that rise. Uh, and I know uh, some of our team have a few questions. Uh, Sean Moran, I think you had called wanting to have the first question. Do you have access to a mic? And maybe I'll turn it over to you, Sean, if, uh, if you're there. Uh oh, there he is. Can you hear Sean? Turn around in the background, too, so have been mute, but you fan thanks for taking the time with this a bunch of different questions but i'll stick to the media side what's been your favorite interview you've done so far and who's the one person you would love to have on your podcast um the one thing about um this podcast is it's it's been amazing for me because i thought i knew all my guests because i booked about 98 percent of them but to be able <laughs> to really sit down and have these real life conversations They've all been amazing because I've learned so much more stuff about my friends. You know what I mean? So it's been a blessing. But if I had to pick one, I would say probably Kobe because it was his last interview. And I got a chance, you know, through us almost fighting to become his teammate, to become his brother. So I got to see the world got to know the Mamba. I got to know Kobe, the person, the man, the father, the businessman off the court. And I, I would always used to mess with Kobe, like, man, you got to show the rest of the world who you are. You're like, you're a cool ass dude. But he was always just this, like, fuck it, it's basketball only. But he's he's someone that he's someone that jokes around a lot. He's someone you can joke to, you can talk shit to him, you can have fun with them. But he never gave the world that other side. So I was glad to see in his transition toward the end, he started opening up more and. In our interview, he just let his guard down and telling us about his family and his marriage to Vanessa and the way he looks at business and how he wanted to put the, his career to bed because he was excited about this next 20 years of, of business. So, uh, you know, unfortunately, losing him in January was a, a dagger to me. Uh, it shook the world, but it definitely shook me um, because he was an amazing, intelligent person, had so much to offer and was going to do so many big things post-career. So it just breaks my heart to know. And actually, today is Gigi's birthday, the, the daughter that passed them. So she would have been 14 mm -hmm. today. So uh, Kobe and Gigi and everyone else on that copter band, I miss them. I love them. And that's definitely been my favorite interview. And if I can interview anybody else, the two people I would say I want to interview are Obama or Michael Jordan. Mm -hmm. So hopefully one of these days I'll be able to get both of them or at least one of them. I'm awesome. sure you will. I'm sure you will. Uh, Jesse Wolf, I know you're uh, a huge fan and one of the biggest basketball fans I've ever met. Do you have a question from New York City there? You muted, Jesse, maybe? Hey, I'm muted there. Sorry about that. Um, hey, Matt, thanks, thanks for taking the time. As Nate said, big fan. Um, uh, appreciate it. 
and uh, I think we have a mutual mutual connection. Eric Newman is he a yeah. producer for you guys? Yeah, he actually. It's my guy. Yeah, he uh, he trained me in high school a little bit uh, okay. growing up back in the day. So tell him I say what up. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, I'm, I played ball growing up, you know, point guard and Steve Nash and Stephen Curry are my two bit favorite players. And, you know, you got to play with both of them. Um, kind of just like would love to hear your, you know, your take on why these guys who may not have been the most physically gifted, uh, but were able to stand out, be MVPs. And also, obviously, it's hard work and everyone knows that. But like, what's it about their like charisma and character and how, what can we learn from them as, you know, in the business world? to take that into our world and how they were able to translate over. So if you could just talk about that, that'd be great. I just think it's their mentality. You know, both guys you mentioned, I'll start with Steve. We actually just had him. We're dropping him in a couple of weeks um, on our, on our podcast. Um, you know, he's a average six, two white guy. You know what I mean? You look at Steve and he blends in in a crowd, but not knowing he's one of the greatest point guards the game has ever seen. So it was just kind of always, you know, the odds stacked against him. So I think it was him believing in himself and really him mastering his skill. You know, when you speak on Steve Nash and you speak on Steph Curry, those are two of the most skilled players we've ever seen, probably because they're not very athletic. You know, Steph can dunk sometimes on a good day. <laughs> but Steve, you know, Steve was an under the rim kind of guy, a smaller guy who held his own with some of the greatest point guards we've ever seen. So I think what stuck out the most is just their heart, their character, their belief in themselves, and then their, 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 their approach to their craft. You know, I got a chance to play with both, so I would see their work ethic was second to none. I mean, amazing. And it's crazy because now Steve is a consultant for the Warriors. So when I was there, I got a chance to see his, the workouts he put Steph through because he particularly worked with Steph and KD. So he's doing these workouts with Steph and KD that would blow people's minds away the kind of shit they're doing the footwork the pivot work the balance work you know whenever Steph or Katie make these crazy left-handed shots or fall away shots like it's not luck because they I literally see them practice it every single day so I just think the attention to detail um could continue to develop their skill and then a strong belief in themselves because both those guys are like you know this is predominantly I'm just gonna keep it, it's a predominantly black league you know what I mean and although I'm light skin and Steph's light skin like they don't you know they, I'll be damned if Steph's going to bust my ass. Or I'll be damned if Steve's going to bust my ass. Like, they take that color thing, even though it's not a race thing, it's kind of a motivating thing. Like, I'm damned if I'm going to let this little light-skinned kid bust my ass. People take and they understand that, so they got to know that they got to hit first all the time. And I'm not saying uh, – literally, I'm just saying as far as approaching the game, attacking the game, putting their fingerprint on the game, and that's something both those guys do. Um, but to touch on Steph a little more, I've never seen anything like him. I don't know if we'll ever see anything like him. I, I like Trey Young, who is somewhat similar. But Steph's ability to shoot the ball, pass the ball, handle the ball, and lead a team is, is, is something I haven't seen um, ever. So it was, a, it was a tremendous honor. Winning a championship with Steph, uh, playing with Steve was dope. Appreciate it. And what yeah. do you see for with, with these big names that, you know, play in that work is you see the, uh, the transition into business. Like Steph has already done that. You see Steve Nash has done that sort of here in Canada. You're uh -huh. starting to see that they sort of translate what they did on the court and sort of all those, whether it's being a leader, teamwork, the rituals that you put in are, you know, translating really, really well. You know, Kevin Garnett is an example. Looks like he's joining Showtime in some sort of capacity. Um, so you're, is that sort of right that you're really starting to see the evolution of a business mindset, you know, and, and managing their money, you know, a little bit differently than perhaps the sort of the, the general belief was? You know, well, I, think it's, I think what we're seeing is now it's really the business of basketball. I think okay. David Stern, rest in peace, did a great job of highlighting, a, even though it's a team sport, individual, like understand that you're an individual, you're your own business, you're your own CEO. And I think David Stern has done a great job of highlighting individuals, allowing them to understand the power that they have. And then I think Adam Silver has obviously taken that to another level. Um, so when you see guys in the tech space, in the media space, in oil, in gold, all that is kind of just having an understanding of like, we really are CEOs. So even though, you know, I'm Matt Barnes, like I've been led into several deals just because of that. So I can only imagine what kind of deal Steph Curry's getting into and KD is getting into simply not necessarily. I mean, I've invested some money, but most of the time it's because of my connections and who I know and how I can help the business grow. You know, I'm working with Nathan on some of that kind of stuff. So it, I, I think just understanding how powerful we are as individuals, uh, the platform we have as athletes. Uh, you know, when we speak, people listen. Hopefully we're saying good stuff most of the time, but we just have a, a unique way of getting people's attention. You know, we're the only people, like kids aren't listening to Stephen A. Smith. 
but kids are people are listening like but the same people listen to Stephen A. Smith are listening to me, but kids are also listening to me because I'm an athlete. So we just have a so much a, a, a much broader reach right. when we sit and we talk about something or we present something or we get behind a brand, we can change people's minds strictly off the fact that, oh shit, okay, Steph uses that, I'm gonna try it. Or you know, Matt says this is a good movie, I'm gonna what you know what I mean? So we really have power in what we say. Obviously, a lot of responsibility comes with that, but I think that's why you've seen the success in the business space because people are starting to realize that man, athletes drive everything. Yeah, no, for sure. And you're seeing that. Uh, well, time for one more question. I know we're past the 15 minutes that we talked about. Apologies, but uh, um, anyone on the team here? Brandon, I know you were a great college player in your own right here in Canada. Maybe you want to end it off with some sort of basketball commentary or, or life as a, as a business leader now? Yeah, I was actually just going to say, can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Okay, cool. Yeah, I actually hated you as a player for the first, like, 10 years of your career. Uh, <laughs> okay. But, uh, but, you know, towards the end of your career when, you know, exactly what you're talking about, you started to kind of show yourself more. You became um, more helpful than I thought. My perception of you totally changed, and I became a big fan. And uh, I think what you guys are doing is awesome and a big fan of the podcast. So uh, thank, thank you. you. Um, yeah, but you, you definitely change a lot of people's perceptions, including mine. And I love, you know, that's one thing I love, like I said, because I think there's, it's not, it's a tons of, it's tons of people, but particular me, because I was really the bad boy of the NBA. I was not as crazy as Dennis Rodman, but I was this generation of Dennis. You're not going to catch me in a dress and trying to go to Vegas during the, oh, I've actually been to Vegas during the season. I'll take that yeah. back. You're not going to catch me in a dress and doing the wild, wild shit he does, but it's just <laughs> as far as the dog mentality, com competitor, controversial. That's exactly who I was, you know, so, so I think everyone thought that, OK, well, that's who he is. He's that guy. But to right. be able to, you know, I love like that shit makes me so happy when people say, you know, you really changed my mind or you're really, you know, you're a good because for so long I had to embrace. And it was hard, you know, from people saying you're a you're an asshole, you're a gang, you're a thug, you're this. And I'm, I'm none of these things. But it's just like, fuck, I can't fight everyone. So I just got to take it. You know what I mean? So to I be think, able to I think kind of part of that was with your like fighting for your kids, too, like when yeah. I Pretty probably, right. Right? You know, oh. just kind of you just, just just letting everyone know I'm just like everyone else. But like I said, I've been fortunate to be able to kind of change my story and tell my narrative. I have to take you know to tell my story post career, and it's been amazing. You know, I mean, when I tell you that I'm getting endorsement deals now when I'm done playing, I'm just like I had a couple while I was playing, but like now that I'm done playing, people want to endorse me. I'm just like because I think they were able to see, okay, well, he really is a good guy. So. I mean, I, that comment means the world to me. I really appreciate that because I do work hard on and, uh, you know, often you don't you try to not care what people think. But in, in the space I'm in and I'm growing my brand, I really do. Like Kobe said, like we hear all the bad shit and some of it is warranted and some of it's not. But it hurts, you know, right. so to be able to, you know, hear people say, OK, well, he is a good guy. and He is this and he is that. That, that definitely makes me feel good. So I appreciate that. Good stuff, man. For sure. And as I said in my intro, uh, you know, from that first meeting, that first impression that I got in, in, in person there in New York City, um, it's just sort of augmented in time. So grateful for your time. Really looking forward to working together as we sort of Absolutely. Absolutely. share your, uh, your insights has been sort of great, you know, thus far. And just the fact of jumping on uh, right now with us today is important. And I know we're all going to be, be leaving better for it and applying this to our day to days in business and, and striving to be better and, and recognize that it's never too late to turn it around either. Right. So so in, in any sort of capacity, uh, cheers to you. It's been really cool to see the, the window into you, your fatherhood, like online. And you can tell that that is the most important thing in your life. And I know that won't yes. change. So thank you. With that, um, it's been a great Friday. It's been a Friday of winning uh, champions all around. And we're going to take that into a big pitch that we're doing this afternoon uh, on a big project actually in L.A. So uh, we'll awesome. take time and, and keep you in mind in, the, in, in spirit. Sounds good. Good luck, guys. Have a good day. Hey, yeah, thank you so much, Matt. All right, that was incredible. Later.